So Dr. Emma describes herself as a one-time couch warrior turned social justice advocate, a speaker and an aerospace engineer who loves to travel and watch classic movies. She was born and raised in a small town, Bamenda, Cameroon. She's one of 11 siblings. You'll have to let us know what number you are in that because I'm curious. She holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master's in Engineering, also a Doctor of Management in Organizational Leadership, and is currently an aerospace engineer for NASA, which is my granddaughter's dream. One of them wants to build spaceships, the other one wants to be in them. So it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. She is also the founder of Women for Permanent Peace and Justice. And in all her spare time, she also just wrote this book. This is Unraveled, A Personal Journey into Conflict, War, and Diplomacy. It tells the story about her daughter, Praxi, and her triumph over a medical prognosis that she would never walk again. She compares that with the recolonized people of the former Southern Cameroons facing genocidal violence, fighting for and determined to overcome. Emma shows anew why survival and human transformation remain at the heart of all health challenges and violent conflict. The book amplifies Emma's advocacy at international conferences and in media um, appearances for young women in developing countries to explore career paths in conflict resolution, peace building, justice, and STEAM, science, technology, and engineering, arts, and mathematics. Emma also makes frequent appearances on The Voice of America, Equinox TV, ABC, and several podcasts on the need for social justice advocacy to safeguard our common humanity. She is committed to creating a world where women, men, and children all have the right to live in dignity. With that, I am pleased to introduce my dear friend, Emma, and I look forward to learning more about her personal story. Take it away. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that introduction. I, before I thank you, Anastasia, let me start by saying there's so much experience in this body of people who have gathered around here. I feel as though I just had my second meeting, I'm so much more enriched. Uh, I do recall somebody saying they're almost 96 years soon, uh, Sydney, uh, Sydney Mobel, I believe I, that's the name. So I just want to say before I get started that when I grow up, I want to be like you, <laughs> like each one of you, so rich in experience. Thank you so much, uh, President Tony, uh, Golden Gate Breakfast Clubbers, as you call yourselves. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here, a very humbling one. I feel like I'm going against perhaps the biggest challenge in my uh, speaking uh, career so far, speaking to you all. So uh, bear with me as I go through this. Anastasia, I just want to tell your friends here, you're indeed a germ. Uh, we did indeed connect. I'm not sure if the Golden Gate Breakfast Clubbers know just how much of uh, a big hearted person you are. So I wanna thank you so much for inviting me into your world. And thank you all for allowing me to come into the space and share my story. Before I get started, I wanted to open up with the next slide that says killing peace and start off by seeing if I can bring down the temperature a little bit for myself because I am already on a high and I need to kind of center a little bit. So join with me as I try and break this um, conversation and open up what I think is a very difficult uh, talk that I'm about to give by telling you that in case you don't know, this month, March, is national women's month and a few other things i thought as i contemplated what i will talk about that killing peace was um, an appropriate title so i went to search to see what else out there is around killing peace right and the only thing i could come up with is this metallic band so in case you are a metallic band fan go out and check it out. I own no rights, so I, I have no uh, connection to them, but that's the only thing I could find out. The other, the other thing that I thought would um, come as an icebreaker is that I'm not sure most of you know that on this day in 1836, 
Texas gained its independence from Mexico. That's another fact I was able to come up with. Another thing that I thought was significant as I go through my talk is that Morocco on this day also gained its independence from France. So those are some markers. Now, um, if as I go through my slide, the next thing that is of some interest that I wish to share with you is the slide that says the pathway of life, the next slide is through conflict. And why is this significant as an opener? It is because indeed the pathway of life is through conflict as we see it. So ladies and gentlemen, uh -oh, Emma, let me open up with two famous quotes that some of you may have heard. One is from T.S. Eliot, he, and he said, we will never cease exploring, and at the end of our exploration is to arrive at the place we first started and discover it for the first time. I want you to hold that thought in your mind. The second maxim I want to leave you with as I start is from Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who said, revolutions come into this world as bastard children half impoverished and half compromise. Our side is supplying the compromise. And this was in the context of the liberation from Great Britain in the formation of this great nation called the United States. Now, why is the pathway of life through conflict? Personally, I say that in this, in the year 2016, the universe declared war on my life that I left behind, the life that I was currently living thousands of miles away and the life growing inside of me. I woke up one day and I cradled my then 24 year old in my hand and she was no more than a two month old, unable to move from the neck downward. As I listened to the words, you will never walk again. I also was in a place where I had to deal with her battle to fight, to regain her health, and a battle with the insurance who wanted her to go home and die. But that's just my story, which is not necessarily unique. But what made it so much more for me was that at the very moment, where I believe the universe had declared war on me, as I looked down on my social media feed, there was war breaking out steps from my childhood home. The pictures of death, destruction, and war that had just taken place in the year 2016. I said in that moment that the country I had sung its anthem carried its flag was not indeed my birth country. So who really was I? I had to go back to learn, learn my own history because history is a compass and history often is used to tell stories with a purpose and the purpose of the victor. So indeed, life is, the pathway of life is through conflict. We also are aware that we live in a country where on both sides, north and south, we are bordered by very friendly countries, east to west by big bodies of water. So conflict is sometimes far removed from the life we live in the United States. But elsewhere, be it Libya, Syria, Sudan, Rwanda, Ethiopia, the Tigray region, Cameroon, my birthplace, the pathway of life is through conflict. So I begin by sharing this with you and going into the next slide, I want to invite you to go on a journey with me. And my goal today is simple, two things only that I invite you to think about. One is I hope to inform you, to bring you into awareness that there is in fact 
a catastrophe happening 7,500 miles away. There is a war that has been described as another walk into a genocide comparable to the one in Rwanda. There is a war that has been described by the Norwegian Refugee Council as the world most neglected conflict happening in the part called Southern Cameroon in a place that most of you call, would know if you do called Cameroon. My second goal today is to invite you on this journey with the hope that together we can move from being couch warriors to social justice advocates, where we together raise the awareness and call the parties who are the belligerents to sit down to talks. Because today we are familiar with that concept of the pathway from war to peace is through dialogue. So moving along, breakfast clubbers, on the next slide, my journey really begins as I go back to learn my ABCs. When I look at the composition of this club, I know there are people here who can tell me this history better than I can ever, ever possibly do from the rich experience that is contained in this body. But bear with me, let me take you back to 1919. As we became victims of historical wrongs, it started when the United States joined the Allied forces and ended the First World War that, like all wars, ended at the table of dialogue with the Treaty of Versailles. But what happened during that treaty? German, the German uh, belligerent were dispossessed of all their colonies in Africa. Those were the terms of their surrender. Of course, they had to make reparation. And all that territory now became what was called mandated territories. That's the sliver of history. I want you to come with me on the journey today. And on the next slide, you would see what was then on my left, which is perhaps on your right on the screen, German Cameroon. On the right of my screen, the green triangle which today is Cameroon, is what became the country Cameroon. So I share this to say, the little piece hanging around that bright green triangle is the place of my birth called Southern Cameroons. At the time of this division, as they say, the, the big partition of Africa, the green triangle was given to the French as a mandated ter territory, and the little light green piece appended to its southern Cameroons with its northern part was given to the British. So at that time, the country Cameroon's borders were formed. But as we go down this journey, the ghost of colonial legacies continues to rear its ugly head, as one would say. We again moved into World War II, and at the conclusion of World War II, what was then the League of Nations became United Nations, the mandated territories became trust territories. That would be the information on, this, on the next slide, uh, President Tony. And the UN Charter that you all now are aware of as it's being talked about in the current context in Ukraine was to maintain world peace, right? We also had um, the case of Cameroon, the country Cameroon in its French constitution, gained independence in 1961 and was admitted into this body called United Nation as its member. The following year in 1961, the part that was given to the British gained its dependence, but as a condition, it was asked to either join Nigeria or Cameroon. During that vote at the United Nations, 64 countries, including the United States, voted for Southern Cameroons to be independent. And the then independent French Cameroon, of course, voted against but there's a whole history as to why that was the case. 
and it gets down to resources. On this slide, I also want to take you on a journey where at the end of the Second World War, the entire free world pledged as a result of the, 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 the Holocaust that never again will they stand by silently while another fellow human is killed. Fast forward to 2013, the body that is formed that is called the Africa Union also took its own pledge under the slogan, silencing the guns by 2020. But as you can well imagine, we're here at 2022. So I share this information to tell you that the prevailing uh, knowledge is of a country called Cameroon Indeed, as I went back to learn my history, they are two countries, La République du Cameroun, which is the Republic of Cameroon that became independent in 1960, and the Southern Cameroons that became independent in October 1, 1961, and opted as one of two states to join the already independent Cameroon in a federation. So moving forward, we see that there is so many lies hidden in history. On the next slide, I put this up to kind of a play on words and, and, and graphics to show the chess game that goes on in the history of the world and how, how so much lies hidden in history. A few pointers here to take away is to say, while many would see a contiguous country of Cameroon, in the course of war, I had to learn that a Cameroon that existed consisted of two equal states. And how did I know that? By unearthing the lies that had laid concealed below the surface. And some of the things that came to mind was even the Africa Union's own constitutive um, charter tells all member countries in Africa that your boundaries are fixed at the time of your independence. Much like the case of Ukraine, you cannot redraw borders. It is then that I learned that the French Cameroon was apart and distinct from the land that was by birth called Southern Cameroons. And the, and the understanding of why a neighboring country would use force to keep another under subjugation. I also learned that even while my land of birth opted for a federation with an already <laughs> independent country in the bigger country opted to dissolve that federation in 1972. I also learned that the president of this country unilaterally declared the state one and indivisible. And again, using the tools of propaganda, the levers of control, education, communication to whitewash the history such that subsequent generation, including myself, came into an understanding that their past was of a one and indivisible country. So this is to tell you that while the world looks to a new world order, there are so many wars that are based on the concept of whitewashed history and concealment of people and a rush for resource exploitation by countries, by the West, etc. So I want to draw your attention here also that while there's a war currently going on in Cameroon that has seen the killing of thousands of people, I want to remind us all that when there was a war in Serbia, and a genocide in Serbia, the US, because of its values, 
along with NATO, intervened to stop a genocide in uh, Srebrenica. The US intervened to aid Kosovo that came under attack by Serbia and allowed nearly 1 million Albanian Kosovars to return to their homeland. Meanwhile, when there was a genocide in Rwanda, there were no interventions. So I also am pointing out here that there is a crisis going on in Cameroon and we are reaching out to the world, mothers and children being killed. And those of us in the safety of the shores of the United States must advocate on their behalf and turn some of that lens to shine on that war so they can be intervention. I could go on about many parallels in the world that have not seen the same level of uh, outreach, the same level of humanitarian support, or the same level of visibility. Now, you might be wondering why the non-intervention or why the selective intervention. Let me just tell you one reason, very simple. The world often prioritizes oil, mineral, raw material exploitation over human lives. That is so true today in Africa than never before in the world. Because as other countries resources dwindle, Africa's resources are yet to be exploited. So moving along, I want to bring you on this journey on the slide that says contemporary origins of the Anglophone problem and quickly tell you, why is there even a war, right? Why is there a war? So in 2016, as I cradled my 24 year old, one year into a hospital stay, I saw images of lawyers with placards on the road, simply demanding that an English speaking part of the country not be subjected to the French uh, uh, culture where we practice civil law and the French practices um, uh, common, we practice common law and the French practice civil law, yet they send French speaking judges to judge our grandmothers in a language they don't speak under a law that is not customary to them. We saw, I saw on my uh, social media feed teachers who poured out into the streets, simply demanding that they take out French teachers from the classroom, teaching their children in a language they don't understand in subjects they have not mastered. The results were the moving in of military, gunship helicopters killing people. I put up a picture here, Golden Breakfast Clubbers, of my nephew by marriage in the yellow jersey who today languishes in jail. He's called Mancho Bibixi. On this day, my cousin, we don't have the concept of cousin in Africa, my brother was alongside Mancho Bibixi as they came for him and he escaped and was refugeed in Nigeria only to subsequently die. So today Mancho Bibixi was brought in front of a military tribunal and sentence without due process for simply standing up on the streets and calling on the government to do what is right by the people of Southern Cameroons. Today, his health is deteriorating and we are not sure about his life. So that is what you will find in the general public as to what is the cause of the war that is now five years since in Cameroon called the Anglophone crisis. But let me move ahead to the next slide and share with you what this war has produced. It has produced the extermination of the Shea and Sika family. Those young kids you see there today do not exist. The government forces called BIR, funded by the US and Britain, trained by Israeli commandos, descended into this village and some of these kids were burned alive in their homes. Their pregnant mothers killed. At the end of the carnage, 
it is estimated 33 people were killed. There have been nearly 500 villages burned, schools burnt down, and so many massacres I cannot list. If I start, I will not finish. There have been atrocities on both sides. The armed groups, that is the young men in the Anglophone regions, as it's called, have taken up arms, defending against the total militarization of the area by the BIA regime. It was estimated as of last year that eight out of 10 school age going children were not in school. That number may have reduced in, in, in a year since. As of today, the UN OCHA, that's the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance in Cameroon, estimates that one out of every two, quote, Anglophone in the affected region is in need of humanitarian assistance. That is 2.2 million people. Moving ahead, I put this up for a reason, not because it stands out any more than any of the other massacres, it's because this happened in my mother's village. This happened to someone I know here in the United States, where on December 10th of last year, soldiers took over an entire village. At the end of their carnage, four people's dead, rotting bodies. I'm sorry for the graphics, apologies, but there is no way of telling the story without highlighting the attendant humanitarian catastrophe. The reason this is of any significance is because someone's home was commanded as a torture chamber. By the time he realized that his, his retirement home in the village was a torture chamber, it is when the pictures of decomposing bodies were brought to his attention. So, Moving along, what is actually the Anglophone crisis? I'm here to tell you that it is not a minority grievance. It's not a linguistic or cultural anxiety problems between the French and the English. It is not a crisis of lawyers demanding common law judges in the courts in the Anglophone areas or teachers demanding English teachers teaching our children. On the next slide, I'm here to share with you the why there is, in fact, a war that is raging, or the, what is called the root causes of the, quote, Anglophone problem. It is the forced integration of what was a state equal in status to another into a highly centralized French country and their rights usurped, their resources exploited and not given back to them. And this was achieved by denying the people of the Southern Cameroons their choice to self-determination, their choice to self-rule, as today enshrined in the U United Nations Charter, Article 76 A and B, that said, at the time you took us as mandated territories into trust territories, you vowed that you would lead these former colonies to self-rule or independence. And even when under uh, UN Resolution 1608, United States voted for our independence, we are yet not independent. Today, in fact, we are at war. On the next slide, I want to highlight something that I thought you'll find very interesting. So for our coming into our federation, in my entire lifetime, I will be 60 this year, I have seen two presidents in my country of birth, Amadou Ahijo, and the long ruling president called Paul Biya. I'd like to describe him as a kingpin, sit tight, president for life, unabashedly, because he has been in power since 1960. From night, I'm sorry, not since 19, since 1968, 
he was Secretary General at the presidency. From 1975 to 1982, he served as Prime Minister. From 1982 to present, he is the president and has been for four decades. His legacy, a genocidal war that is today in its fifth year. Now look on the other side of your screen. French, who maintains a tight grip on the continent since the Versailles Treaty. France has not left, is still a colonial master. They have been not one, not two, not three, not four, but 10 living successive democratically elected president from Charles de Gaulle to Emmanuel Macron and all in between. And why is that important? Because those two presidents in Cameroon are puppets of the French regime. Now you might say, Emma, you are too biased. You're too close to the forest to see the trees. Now, let me explain myself. Bear with me. The money that Cameroon uses, the CFA, is printed in Chamalier, France. At the time of France's giving independence to Cameroon, they sign a cooperation agreement where it says, if you are ever in trouble, I will send my military to help you. If you ever discover oil or gold or bauxite or timber or rare earth mineral, I have first right of exploitation. If I say no, you can go find somebody else. And oh, by the way, your national treasury funds must be deposited in the central bank in Paris. And if you need that money, thank you very much. I will give it to you at the prevailing loan. Your money is pegged to mine and I determine the interest rates of conversion. Moving along. So I talk about killing peace. Why? Because too often we tend to pray all of our problems into submission and forget that so much lies buried in history and so much is dependent on us truly doing the hard work to maintain peace that is a positive peace. So La République, as we call them, the French part of Cameroon, is very closely tied to the global north in many ways than one. Like most African countries, it votes along the United States, typically against the Iron Curtain issues, which goes against Russia. So for that, the, the North lobbies them very hard to get them on their side. And for their vote, they are willing to look the other way, even if it comes into war. The US has been partnering with Cameroon to fight what it calls ISIS of West Africa. And as I said earlier, the United States and Britain funded a good war which is to fight terrorism. But those um, military equipment and money was turned on the people of Southern Cameroons. And of course, I mentioned the prioritization of exploiting raw materials. Cameroon is rich in oil, it's an oil producing country. We have bauxite, gold, timber, and other subs uh, crops that we export. Those are prioritized over human lives. But I also mentioned at the bottom there that some of the atrocities have been on both sides. As you can well imagine, war is a dirty game. The armed groups also are now have acquired weapon and are now wrecking havoc, not only on the military and sometimes on civilians. So I say the ghost of division has come out and the tribal wars are in full force. So let me try and move a, a forward here very quickly. I talk about killing peace and how to go from couch warrior to social justice. So very quickly, where do we go from here? We need to think about the DNA of conflict as we think about how to go from conflict to peace and peace that's positive. So here I share with you that what I've seen in conflict is really the ways in which conflict has found its way in our systems, in our community, and now we see them globally. 
conflict lies through indoctrination. That's my legacy. Conflict lies through differences, differentiations without distinction, div divisions, and diminishes. What do I mean by that? You would hear Northwest, Southwest in Cameroon. I could go on and on. That's one way to divide and conquer, differentiate sometimes without di division. You would hear of conflict that says Cameroon is one and indivisible. It is about diminishing your own truth so as to elevate another one's truth. It is, as I've said also about saying we don't need to think about conflict. We can only think about peace and forget the hard work to get there. That's about awareness. Ultimately, con conflict, the DNA of conflict is to control and ultimately erase. So I, I say the pernicious nature of erasure where you are told you something else. And each time you awaken to that truth, you're either told you're the belligerent, you're the troublemaker. So we need to think about conflict as we think about the DNA of conflict, as we contemplate peace in the world. So what are the social justice strategies that we can all benefit from? First, awareness. Second, understanding that human suffering concerns all, all, whether it's in distant places as in Ukraine today, see how it is now the conversation at a coffee table. Similarly, whether it's in Cameroon, 7,500 miles away, human suffering concerns all, all, because we can no longer talk about NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. We have seen people cross the Darien Gap at great risk to life to present themselves at the southern Cameroon's uh, Mexico border. We've seen people die in the Mediterranean, fleeing these wars. So sooner or later, it does become in our backyard. Just recently, the Human Rights Watch put out a, uh, a very stinging article where last year, United Nations deported 90 Cameroonians who had fled war only to go back and be tortured. So we are all called to advocate for these kinds of injustices. It is incumbent on us to prevent atrocity crimes by speaking up because our collective humanity requires such. As um, Desmond Tutu would say, and I believe also Martin Luther King said, silence is taking sides with the oppressor. So what does social justice advocacy mean for me? It simply means working to end impunity, pushing our political leaders to take the bold step, to have the political will, to not do what I call selective intervention. We've seen the intervention in Ukraine, where today 2,000 people have been killed. In the war in southern Cameroon, to date, it is estimated nearly 20,000 people have been killed, 500 homes burnt, children out of school, thousands incarcerated in distant torture chambers. So it is incumbent on us to call for the political will and to end selective intervention so as to, as to prevent human suffering and also early intervention. We cannot go back to the Holocaust, not to Rwanda because all of those occurred because there was not the political will, there was slowness in intervention and there was selective intervention. And that we must all engage and bring pressure. Finally, I talk about social justice strategies as being real. I'm gonna be very brief because we don't have enough time. It's really the responsibility, the engagement being answerable and also leading leadership. I can talk about that at another time. So the last slide here is simply, if you use your phone, you will, it will bring you to a website. If you put your phone against this QRC code, it will bring you to a website I created 
to petition the Pope to join the Swiss in bringing the belligerents to sit down and talk. That is the least you, I believe you can do for the thousands of women and children who are suffering. Today, I run an organization called Women for Permanent Peace. We are a victims-based organization. I work with the grassroots women at elevating their, their voices so that they can be heard, their suffering, their plight can be heard. I also ask you to look into supporting some of the resolutions that have been passed by Congress. Some have passed the House, but have not passed the Senate. We have HR 5564 calling for the, for the designation of Cameroon, Cameroonians as protected on the TPS. And then um, there is also resolution 684. And your Congresswoman in California, Karen Bass, has been very helpful in this, but it needs to have some teeth. So let me end here by saying, I'm Emma Osong. I live in the United States. I'm a US citizen. My origins are Cameroon, but I woke up to a new reality that said, I am indeed a Southern Cameroonian entitled to rights of self-determination for the people I've left behind, my family. I am advocating for family in jail, for family who have died, and for the millions I may never see, but who are also my family. And I ask you to come into my world, just as you have come into the world of the Ukrainians, to not be silent in the face of oppression. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Emma. That's an amazing story and a great cause as well. I am going to uh, open it for question and answers. If anybody has any, um, feel free to you know speak and uh, open up the microphones. I see Craig and Anastasia. Would you do me a favor and facilitate this for a moment? I need to step away briefly. Yes, Craig, go ahead. Um, thank you. And uh, Antonio has a question also. Um, so thank you for your presentation, Emma. That was great. Um, I mean, I hate to say great in this, the context of the topic. It it's, uh, makes me really sad to hear this. But um, I think you have a wonderful voice and I, I, you're a great communicator. So thank you so much for, you know, taking a real difficult topic and having so much grace and uh, presence and discussing that. So thank you. The uh, the question I had is really Mancho. Is it Mancho, your cousin? Was that his name? So uh, I, it's a nephew by marriage. Yes. Oh, a nephew. So my okay. nieces, that's uh -huh. their cousin. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So and so he's in jail right now. Have you had any contact with him? Is there is there are they treating him okay? What's what's happening? There is. It's difficult to maintain contact with them. You could call. Uh, you could communicate, but very short periods. Now, there is a campaign out there to release all political prisoners. I think it's, it's on Twitter. That's one thing I fail to put here as well. There's so many hashtags, so, right. many, um, so many outreach to put them all on a sheet of paper. I need perhaps 10 because everybody's trying everything they can to shine the light on these guys who are in gulags, in dungeons, they are not fed properly, they're not give, given adequate health care. So one of the things that I try to do under the platform that I have is to reach out to um, the, the, um, the Red Cross, the human rights organizations working in country to continuously highlight the plight of these, these individuals and ask and query them when was the last time they paid uh, a visit to them. Because only through those organizations can they really get any true information because they're allowed to go in and, and, and examine them, visit them. So it's, it's a murky situation. Uh, Cameroon is a draconian uh, country, 
on paper is democratic, but it practices dictatorial uh, tendencies. So he's been sentenced by a tribunal. His health is not as good. We are always concerned and continue to be concerned. None of them should be in jail. He never carried a gun. He simply went on the streets to protest. Wow. Anastasia? Oh yeah, you're, you're muted, Anastasia. I'm back. Antonio. Sorry, okay, take over, please, Tony, because I'm not good at this no, part. Thank you for <laughs> calling me. Antonio, you had a question? Thank you, President Tony. Uh, Dr. Emma, thank you for a powerful presentation uh, today. Um, the highlight for me, or array perhaps of, of sunlight, is this notion that of the concept of cousin and that you don't have the concept of cousin. Could you explain that a little bit more? Uh, what, 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 the, what do you mean? You don't have the word for cousin, you don't have the concept of cousin, everybody's a brother. Could you explain that? It's very simple. Thank you, uh, Mr. Peach Freak. <laughs> I have to find out what that means. The concept of um, not having a cousin is, is, um, is it's not only facetious, but it's culturally rooted, right? It's not facetious, it's culturally rooted. Um, I like to say that I was perhaps 12 years old when I found out that my aunt was not my sister and my cousin was not my brother because the household I grew in, my aunt lived side by side with me, cared for me because she was an older uh, person. And my cousin was perhaps the, about the age of an older sister. And I just thought, okay, after Susan, no, after Juan must be Peter, Peter, who's now my cousin, my brother. And my aunt was just an older sister. So uh, we, we are communal in nature. And we, we love um, environments where there are no distinctions, right? But as you grow older, then you know, oh, my aunt's child is my cousin. So the concept of brother is to show the, 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 the love in a family and the integratedness. Thank you for that. This reminds me of the movie uh, Amistad and the scene where uh, the word try was to try to create a result was being used and in the language uh in the native language spoken by the prisoners uh, at that time is that there was no word for try there's no word for try you is you do it you simply do it and the idea that there's no concept of cousin that everybody's a brother or everybody's a sister it's such a powerful concept and the idea of in the states we in a way, although we have a love for our cousins and, and nieces and nephews, all those various things, it's almost as if this concept of cousins and third cousins and distance cousins separates us and keeps us apart and disconnected. It doesn't bring us as close together as the concept that you share in the communal type group. And there's something powerful and beautiful about that. It's very hard to go to war against your brother or against your sister. It's a little bit easier to go to, go to war potentially with your distant cousin twice removed. Uh, and so, uh, even though you don't want to do that either, but there's something beautiful about that. And, and, and for, for us in the States, that's a powerful concept of your family. Uh, and, and, and almost the concept going back to our own civil war, how difficult that was for us, uh, in the States too. So as you're sharing these concepts with other folks and you're talking to more about folks in the United States, these might be some concepts to, to add some extra emphasis into, to create additional relatability uh, and, and, and hit the heartstrings and the, and the emotions with folks here to more deeply connect with your approach, even though it's tremendously important uh, and deep uh, as it is. But uh, thank you for this beautiful presentation. And also thank you for ending it with a call to action of some sort, something that people can actually do to help uh, you in your, in your process. So thank you for that. Okay, Bill Buchanan. Uh, good morning, Emma. Thanks for <clears throat> joining us and illuminating uh, this corner of the world, which a lot of people, I'm sure, are not familiar with. Um, 
I uh, picked up on your comments about, you know, conflict, peace, the road to peace, and so on and so forth. <laughs> During my 80 years, I have uh, seen both sides of it. I was uh, uh, a Marine in the 60s, uh, conflict in Vietnam. So I've seen up close uh, the effects of war. I also worked for the Federal Bureau of Investigation for many years on a squad that was devoted to neutralizing by force, if necessary, uh, groups of Arab terrorists. And that was uh, an interesting uh, insight into you know, that, that uh, sort of activity, worldwide activity. Uh, during that uh, journey, I read a book which affected me uh, profoundly. It was written by Ayan Hirsi Ali. And she's at that time was a young woman from Somalia who I believe emigrated to this country. Uh, and she, uh, she reminded you, your, your effort to uh, shed light on this problem in Southern Cameroon uh, reminds me very much of her campaign to uh, bring awareness about some of the <coughs> uh, ideological conflicts uh, in the Muslim world. But here's my question. I mean, as you pointed out, there are there are conflicts all over this globe. It's hard to keep track of them, you know. But my question is, for you is, what would trigger a military intervention in that conflict in between Cameroon, Republic of Cameroon and Southern Cam uh, Cameroon? What would be the uh, criterion to trigger military intervention by the UN? <clears throat> Very good question, Bill. Thank you for that. So the, as I mentioned earlier, the United States has intervened in crises that were less. So the equivalent here is once you take your military into civilian population and you start killing, when you kill a, a, a group of people, you target only a group of people and you kill them, it's called genocide. And when you do that systematically, it's called atrocity. When you don't make a distinction between combatant and civilians, when you urbanize civilian centers, even if you are a sovereign country as Cameroon would like the world to believe, you have violated international law and you're subject to solidarity with the international community. So the same way the United States is in solidarity with Ukraine, over the aggression of Russia, it's the same way that United States ought to be and the international partners be in solidarity with the court Anglophones who today you know are a separate and distinct people by all definition that they have a territorial boundary separate from Cameroon, French Cameroon, even though they formed a union that they broke so what will trigger, it's the number of killings, it's the violation of international law, and the fact that the president in November of 2017 stood and declared war publicly and said, I'm moving troops in this part of the country, his country, as he calls it, to declare war on what he calls terrorists. Terrorists were these people, my nephew by marriage, who simply took to the streets to say, we are English speaking. We came into a relationship as two states of equal status. We have no roads, we have no water, we have no good schools. You send French speaking teachers to a classroom, take them away. They were arrested, gunship helicopters shot others dead and hauled off to distant jails and they're languishing. The president, of Cameroon, Paul Bia violated international law by using military force to kill innocent civilians and killing them specifically because they are of a, a, a different, uh, call it uh, language. So that is the, one of the definitions of uh, genocide when you target a group of people international community must intervene. Now, I'd like to add here, Bill, that uh, Mr. Uh, Karim Khan, the chief prosecutor of the ICC, International Criminal Court, yesterday announced that he's opening up 
investigations into the, uh, uh, the, the, the atrocities in Ukraine. This is unilateral. He can also do that mm. in the crisis in Southern Cameroons, but because we don't have the media visibility, no, CNN is not carrying it 24 seven. The fact that 500 villages have been burned and those mothers are languishing, nearly a million internally displaced is of no consequence to you because the knowledge is not there. Hmm. Thank you very much for the presentation. <clears throat> okay, Anastasia, we've got time for one and then we'll stop the recording. Um, and then um, I'll, I have to leave, but I'll leave the room open if anybody else wants to stay around and chat after that, so. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, this is, this is where I'm gonna show my ignorance in not really fully understanding the difference between common law and civil law, and in particular, how it relates to this. And I'm wondering if you could just expand a little bit upon that so that I can be a little better educated. <laughs> yes. So those are some of the cultural anxieties, which are what you call the superficial problems. I can come to that. So what I presented in answering your question, I presented what are the superficial triggers, and then I presented the root causes. The root causes are rooted in the failed decolonization of the Southern Cameroons, where a piece of a land with its people were told to join an already independent country. So those superficials are language and law. As to the law, because the British colonized the Southern Cameroons, they brought their culture to that place, the language I speak to you now, including my mother tongue, and of course the forced language of assimilation, which is French. And those, um, uh, practices of common law became our culture. Common law is, is the same law practice in the United States. Evidence, guilty, you must prove my guilt in order to convict me. I'm always presumed innocent. I have rights to be merandized. I have rights to hold my peace and not testify against me. And you can force my relative either to testify against me some of the tenets of common law, the presumption of innocent paramount, freedom of the body of the person and the presentation of that person and evidence is paramount in the law. In civil law, in the French colony became their culture as so is the language. So civil law is guilt and then you have the burden of proving innocence. And the what you call the Napoleonic rel relics of governance and law were brought down, where you are in a hyper-centralized dictatorial environment where your freedoms are curtailed, so are you, so are your legal rights. The rights to speak up is regulated by the government, the right to assemble and, and assemble in peaceful protest is given as a right, as opposed to assume. So this rights of self-determination, rights of uh, uh, living your life to the fullest are not taken for granted under civil law, but they are assumed as, in, um, as we do in America under common law. Thank you, that, that helps tremendously. And I know we need to wrap up, but I do want to ask everyone if, if you would consider getting Dr. Emma's book and then it, it especially, please, 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 there is nothing more that I would ask other than all, you know, this, the, the petition and, and helping out and support those organizations. But um, if you can do a review on her book as a speaker's agent, I know how powerful reviews are. And if you know of any groups or organizations, podcasts, et cetera, that she can get on, let's try to get this voice out there as much as we possibly can. So thank you. Thank you. That was incredible, Emma.